there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. This is New Zealand, Aotearoa. We're blessed with great mountains, beautiful sweeping beaches, and wild rivers. Over 180,000 kilometers of them. As a mountainous island chain in a boisterous corner of the world's largest ocean, our rainfall can be massive, making our rivers turbulent and unpredictable. I'm Craig Potton, and I've been photographing New Zealand landscapes just like these for 40 years. I just love it. It's my passion. Making art out of the mountains, out of the forests, out of the coastline, and out of our rivers. For me, they are the arteries that connect everything together. I'm going to travel some great New Zealand rivers, each one with its own story. Wow, this is nice. I'll meet people who care for rivers and the creatures which live in and around them. Hey, what a beautiful meal that is. I'll journey between source and sea and try to understand how rivers have shaped the land and influenced our culture. But above all, I want to see if we can use our rivers wisely and protect their wildness for our children. There are few rivers on earth that flow almost unimpeded by man through a totally natural landscape from their source to the sea. I'm about to travel down one of them, the Mokianui River. My journey will take me from an alpine plateau down through ancient native forest. I'll raft through a gorge rich in biodiversity, from rare land snails to native eels, past relics of the gold rush and on to the wild west coast. But this pristine environment is under threat. The shadow of an 85 metre dam hangs over this remote valley. We'll examine the issues around the dam and what it could mean for this magical wilderness. The source of this wild river is a kilometre above sea level on the Thousand Acre Plateau. A massive chunk of limestone pushed up from the sea floor 30 million years ago. I've come to this high point to take in a view today becoming less and less common all over the world. From this point, nothing was made by man. There is no human imprint whatsoever. This is wilderness, and it's a great antidote to our over-polluted and over-populated human world. Don't get me wrong, I do love society, I love culture, I love a good cup of coffee. But we do need to get away from it all, and this, in all its splendour, is greater than anything that we can create. We're in Kaharangi National Park, we're at the top of the Makanui River, and the reason we're here is that we're sitting on a limestone plateau. Limestone is an amazingly fertile rock for native plants. This is a late flowering gentian. This park alone holds 80% of all the different types of alpine plants in New Zealand. It makes it one of the world's great biodiversity hotspots for alpine plants. So what we're seeing here is a whole range of alpines. Flax, we've got some daisies, so is two different species in here. Uh, we've probably got a parahebe little late flowering parahebe here, and another sort of hebe over here. And often neglected, but really significant throughout the whole park are the tussocks. What's absolutely delightful is we've got some little red berries just in here. Over two metres of rain falls here every year, and this great plateau collects its fair share, then slowly surrenders it to gravity. A river never starts in one place, but I guess these trickles of water here are as good a place as any to start my journey down the Makanui. From here my journey will continue downstream to some really special places. I'll be joined by some old friends and I'll do something I've always wanted to do, to raft the extraordinary Mahikanui Gorge right out to the sea. I drop down off the plateau and into the south branch of the Mokianui and one of our few untouched podocarp beach forests.
I'm a great believer in taking a camera, standing silently before the subject, and just letting the images talk. I like to let the forest and the creek bed fill the frame and to feel it coming closer and closer until there are just windows of green framed by trunks and branches so that you lose that feeling for depth. That's what I try to achieve in my forest images. But there's a threat hanging over this wilderness. Resource consent has been granted for an 85 metre hydroelectric dam, which would flood 14 kilometres of the Mokianui Valley. If the dam goes ahead, we will never again see this valley the way it is now. After a solid hike downstream, I meet up with my old friend, wilderness writer and tour guide, Andy Dennis. Hey, hi buddy. Hi there, Craig. Really good to see you. Oh, great to see you. We've had many an adventure together, and after several hours walking, it's time to cool off in the Makianui. <laughs> yeah. So, my thoughts, my friend, is that we should go for a swim here. We've even got a beach to ourselves. <laughs> we have. <laughs> Are we ready to go, Andy? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Isn't it? oh, it's pretty cold, mate. It's nippy, but it's refreshing. It's absolutely stunning today on the plateau. I mean, you look down on this river, it's extraordinary. It is so large, this whole catchment completely unadulterated, except for just a little bit out here of the, yeah. of the grass and that. So you come up the track today, buddy. How was it? It's a fantastic track yeah. to walk, and it's, it's, it's certainly one of my favourite river mm. walks mm. in the country so, yep. and, and on the west coast. I don't think there's a track that goes through a long lowland gorge on the west coast that actually matches this one. Walking in in the sunshine, I was just would have loved to have rafted. Mind you, we're going to have some trouble with some of the rapids tomorrow because there's not a lot of water over there. You reckon? Mm. We'll, be bumping, we'll have an interesting trip. Bumping on the rocks a bit, maybe. There's one or two places, especially towards this top end, where I thought, hmm, I wonder how the raft's going to get through there. Coming up, we head off on our two-day raft trip down the river. It's day two on the Mokianui. Andy and I are about to head off on our adventure down river. For this leg of the journey, we'll be joined by Forest and Bird Field Officer Debs Martin, who knows more about wild rivers in this part of the world than anyone. Hey, and freshwater fish expert Michael Joy. <laughs> on the right? On the right? Oh. We're keen to get on the water yeah. with our guides Tim and Dave from Ultimate Descents. How many pens from all that? Mark's there. I've flown this river a few times, I've photographed from its banks, but this time I'm on the river. I'm going to feel its energy and its pulse for the first time. I just can't wait. All together, forward paddle. This feels like a good way to be travelling this river, because Mokianui means big raft, a reference to the early vessels Māori explorers used to navigate these waters. When the west coast rains pour down, this river becomes a grade 4 river, which means it can be difficult and dangerous. With the water level low at present, however, the rapids are easier, but there are heaps of rocks to avoid. While Māori travelled these waterways in search of panamu, or greenstone, European settlers soon became interested in the area too, as gold fever spread from central Otago to the west coast. From 1864, prospectors scoured the major rivers, hunting for the precious metal. Our first stop will be to see if we can find any remnants of gold mining activity here. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Short scramble up from the river. Very cool. And here we are on this elegant old track, the old Mokanui pack track. Six feet wide, or six feet in the old days, two metres today, just about flat. Look at it, running yeah, yeah. around here all on the contour. Right. This is the way it goes, just about all the way through the gorge. For the miners themselves, the reason they, they came up these rivers all the time is because so much rock is exposed along the edge of the rivers. It's much easier to see gold-bearing rock Look at the hillsides here, yeah, absolutely yeah. draped in, in forests. Yeah. Where, where do you find exposed rock? Uh, Same with the early geologists. Yeah. They followed rivers because that was the way they got, they got a handle on the kind of rocks that were in the country. Rivers are great for geologists and gold miners, Craig. Great for gold. Yeah. Yeah. So how they build a track like this, mate? 
Oh, pick, shovel, dynamite. You can see this little clearing looming up through the trees here on oh, the right. Yeah, yeah. One of the very few bits of flat land along this, this steep, gorgy river. But this is where um, Seatonville was. Okay. This was a little village for people that uh, worked the mines and stamping yeah, batteries yeah. around here. Probably two or three hundred at the maximum. Yep. Living a little... Two or three hundred here, no, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Just were, here. Oh, they just crowded together. Around, Fairly yeah, yeah. small, humble abodes built yeah. from local wood. Canvas stretched over it, tin chimneys. Yeah, yep. Should we go and have a look at it? Why not, mate? Why After not? After you. Let's go. Nothing else like this all the way down the river. It's, it's, and it, you yep. don't see it from the river, Craig. It's hidden away up here. Hey, look, Andy. Something over oh, here. Oh, yes, yes. That, that, now, that could be what, a cooking pot or something, couldn't it? Cooking the stewing or what? I'd say that's a lid from an old camp oven, Craig. Oh, um, yeah. You know, big, big pot right. that they could use for just about cooking anything that would hang over the fire. Uh -huh. Just the sort of thing you find in lots of these old mining areas, buried in the grass. If you look carefully, you can see this a, a square shape here built yep, up of stones. Yep, this yep. would have been the hearth. Okay. There's another just over there and probably another where that tree right. is. So that the, the little small. shacks would have been very close very together. Small. And just across the stream there, probably 200 yards, meters away is the, the Tui flies stamping batteries right. going probably 24 hours a day. So the industrial centre of the space. The industrial centre of the domestic this space, plant. yeah. Right. So here, this is very much the, the skeleton of the old stamping battery here, Craig. It, uh, it's amazing, eh? It's still in the bush. Sitting exactly where it was. So, so what happened here, mate? What, I mean, this is extraordinary. The ore would have been put in from either side. You'd have had a big wheel over the top. We'll yeah, see yeah, that yeah. wheel later. Lots of noise and action. Quartz with gold in the side, a slurry coming out here, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, would be, which would have been processed subsequently. More noise, you and I couldn't carry on a conversation here with it going on. And this would have run sometimes 24 hours a day with the pressure of water coming from the stream through these pipes, yeah. driving a water wheel. This is the heart of the, the Mokanui mining operation would have been here. And all the companies yeah, yeah. that were, were, were mining here, the Red Queen, the South Pacific and the Mokanui Company, all their all oh, would have all been through the same all one. through the same battery. Operative use of a bloody good big piece of metal, huh? Been here since yeah. 1882. It's great to see these gold mining relics out here in the middle of nowhere, exactly where the miners left them. They're the only signs left of what was once a major industry. This is the powerhouse of the Mokanui mining area, Craig. That water hurtling down those big pipes, hitting these buckets, there's 25 or 30 buckets around here, turning this wheel, driving the stampers, um, crushing the quartz, releasing the gold, essentially. You can just imagine what it would be like bringing a great hunk of iron like this up the track, even on the back of a horse. I'm hugely impressed by what these guys got through to get machinery in here. When the gold ran out, the miners disappeared and settlements like Seatonville became ghost towns. The things that drove them away from here were the difficulty of getting gold out, that you know, they, they weren't getting rich returns from here, the difficulty of access, the remoteness, the weather, yeah. the floods. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was not an easy place. You know, we're here now, it's still fairly warm season of the year, but imagine being here through the winter months when the sun hardly penetrates into this valley. And so it wasn't an easy life at all. Returning to the river, we've got our work cut out for us as we get in amongst some grade three rapids. In these narrow gorges, there's evidence of a couple of events which caused major shake-ups of the landscape the 1929 and 1968 earthquakes. They both measured over seven on the Richter scale and triggered landslides throughout the area. There were huge slips all through this river, the Materi River, the Karamea River. Yeah. And, and I mean, the scars are still rare. I mean, it's one thing that makes this part of the river absolutely special is, is the fact that tragic as it is, people die in earthquakes and the land falls away, is you've got these amazing rock fortresses sort of that the river has to come through all the way. And, you know, as a photographer, just looking at the angulated rocks and these very beautiful forms that you get in the rock, I mean, that's part of the whole dynamic of, of the land falling apart in the way, isn't it? 
the 1968 60, yep. earthquake yep. brought quite a quite an amount of material down into this river as well. You've got these lovely tall forests, you know, the tall rata and and, and fantastic kofi along the edges. But then you you have this amazing seral or secondary forest that's, that's starting to show and, itself and on the top here. Younger cereal forest has yeah. more plants that give off a lot more berries and, mm. and you get a lot more birds as a result. So you're getting quite a neat sort of balance between the very ancient, you know, older trees and this, this new stuff here. It's a very dynamic landscape, I guess, in that, in that yeah. respect. Huh? After the break, I go in search of a rare carnivore. New Zealand's west coast is notorious for its high rainfall. Prevailing westerly winds blow moist air off the Tasman Sea. As it hits the Southern Alps, the water vapour cools and condenses into rain clouds. So when you're travelling through the coast, it pays to pack your wet weather gear. The rain has arrived right on cue in the middle of our raft trip. Not that any of us minds. It's all part of the great water cycle, the continuous movement of water up from the ocean and into the atmosphere through evaporation, then back down to earth and into our rivers. And right now, it's all flowing freely, just as it should be. In between rain showers, Andy and I take a break on the banks of the Mokianui to hunt for a rare carnivore. We're looking for the real flag bearer of this park, the giant carnivorous land snail. It's an extraordinary creature. They're an amazing form of life, and they're ancient too. They may be as old as the, as the tuatara, or our native frog, 80 million years at least. It usually comes out at night time, but sometimes we see it in the daytime on sort of rainy days like this. So there is a chance that we might find one here. There are over a thousand different types of land snail in New Zealand, but the snails of the Paolofanta family, they're the biggest. Measuring up to nine centimetres across, they're the sumo wrestlers of the snail world. Oh, it'd be really good though, Craig, to pick one up. You know, I, I've, the more I spend in these places, the more I realise that these big land snails, they're, they're an important part of New Zealand's biota as kiwi and kākāpō, and, uh, and not many people really know that or appreciate that, but land snails have been around, they're only found in New Zealand, they're nowhere else in the world, they're, they're these Yep. Fabulous animals that so many, so few people know about. And what spooks me a little bit, as being a vegetarian, is that these things are carnivorous. I mean, these just <laughs> hoe into these great beasts, hoe into other animals, huh? Principal diet, earthworms. They right. drag them back into their shell, suffocate them, and eat them. This northwest corner of the South Island, it's, it's absolutely the land snail capital of New Zealand. It's the land scale capital of the world. Right. The Paolofanta capital of the world. But having said that, a lot of them are, are, are restricted to very limited areas. They're very, very interesting. They live at certain altitudes, they live on certain substrates, and some of them are of, of very limited distribution. And that too makes them, mm. them mm. very, very important. Yeah, yeah. And they're also very beautiful animals, Craig. That for us. We have to the, find one we now, have Andy. To find we have one. to find one. We can't go on talking about this without <laughs> finding one. But they're also notoriously camera shy, and Andy and I are having no luck. So I've arranged to meet a land snail expert, Kath Walker, from the Department of Conservation. This sort of area. This is the sort of area they like. Yeah. Under ferns, um, under trees. Yeah. You have to pull aside all this other stuff and get right in, in the bases of things because during the day they'll be hiding um, as moist as they can get. As That's not very moist, Kath. It's not very moist. No. I think we're going to struggle probably trying to find a live one today. And it's just too dry, even here. Kath isn't having any luck either. So she shows me her shell collection. So if I put them in the, Up to um, 21 different species of Paolofanta have been identified. Aren't they gorgeous? They are, yeah. And five of them live right here on the Mokianui. So these are all forested. Yep. The species lives in the forest. But other Paolofanta live in the alpine tussock zone, and they've been the slowest to be discovered right. because it's much harder to see the shells. Andy and I looked topic. for some on the top, so we came back empty-handed. Yeah, I'm we not looked, surprised to hear We looked hard it. for over half an hour, Kath. So. Yeah, <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> and how Put long, in a few hours. How, and how long have you been looking for them? Yeah, 30 years. Ah, right. 
It's an acquired pleasure, <laughs> which <laughs> only the joys of the, the discovery, the joy of the unalloyed joy of finding something new. I think right. I'd probably characterise um, snail looking. And it has to be quite good because they're in wet, untracked places generally. So there's a lot of bush bashing. Um, there's a lot of head down, thumb up, um, <laughs> sifting through the forest litter in order to find the snails in the first instance. But since the arrival of the European, land snail numbers have seriously declined due to introduced predators like possums, hedgehogs, rats and pigs and the destruction of their forest and tussock habitats. These are confined to New Zealand. They're confined to a small part of New Zealand, which is why they're poorly known. Because they live in wet west coast forests, people don't go there and that's why people don't know about them. And if they did know about them, right. <laughs> um, I think I think it would be a whole different story. Back on the river, we head downstream to hunt for more of the local wildlife with freshwater fish expert Mike Joy. Well stocked with introduced brown trout, the Mokianui is a great river for fly fishing, but it's also home to some important native species. Gordon, go coming towards us here, coming. Come on, come on. The long finned eel come is on. one of the largest freshwater eels in the world. Oh, oh, come on. Come on. This species is found only in New Zealand and the Pacific where it breeds. It's been swimming up and down our waterways for 65 million years. But he's not going to bite your finger out. But lately, it's become a threatened species due to commercial fishing and habitat loss caused by pollution and hydro dams. People have a sort of a strange image of eels. They tend to think, uh, some people do, that they're a bit mm. black and slimy mm. and, you know, their eyes aren't blue and they don't look at you and, and, and you know, have a slightly negative... But, but, I mean, they are wonderful creatures, aren't they? Oh, they're amazing. I mean, obviously, I think that's linked to snakes. You know, we have an uh, innate fear because they look like snakes. But, yeah, if anybody takes the time to, to get to know them, you know, I mean, there's mm. lots of places where you can go where you can feed tame eels or you can come somewhere True. like this and, yeah, yeah. and feed an eel. And, and, and just, I think as soon as people do that, they yeah. realise that they're yeah. actually really beautiful animals. We're talking about a habitat. I mean, yep. this place is going to be damned. Yep. What happens to the eels in a river like this? Well, because they migrate, then the, the biggest barrier to them is to where they need to get to is dams. So already in New Zealand, they've lost 50% of their habitat to dams. So this would just be another one. We just don't seem to treat our creatures in the river as well as we treat. And they're natives. I mean, have yeah. every bit as much respect we should yeah. have for them as we do for the kiwi or the kiriru or, mm. you know, things that we love on the land. Yeah. We don't treat them like that, do we? No, and, it, and it's interesting because the Department of Conservation has classified the long finial with the same threat ranking as kiriru and really? kiwi. Yeah. So they have that threat ranking, and yet, bizarrely, they, they are... A, the Ministry of Fisheries has them as a quota under the quota management system as, as a commercial fishery. You're kidding. Right, so a huge proportion of our eels now get exported off, over, you know, overseas and the reason that there's a market out there for them is because the other eels in the world are, are on the verge of extinction. So the European eel, the American eel and the Japanese eel are all at or near extinction and so now there's this great big market overseas for our threatened species so we can sell them over there. What surprises me, Mike, and I guess it does you, is that New Zealanders do love their rivers. But we, let's be honest, we don't really know what's in our rivers. Um, yeah. And let's also be honest, we don't really care enough for what's in our rivers, do we? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean that's the thing for me as a researcher in this area. I've just become incredibly frustrated with the fact that they're, they're all going extinct. Mm. So now we have two thirds of our freshwater fish species are on the threatened species yeah. list. So. And, and not just them, also our kura, the freshwater crayfish, and the kakahi, the freshwater mussel, are also on the threatened species list. After the break, we head downstream to the proposed dam site, and I find out just what it would mean for this valley. It's taking out about 330 hectares of forest and river. day three of our trip down the wild Mokianui River. Apart from a few traces of the old gold mining days, the overwhelming feature of our journey has been the unspoiled nature of this wilderness as a habitat for the rare creatures that live amongst it. But we're about to reach a spot where all of that could change forever. 
Yeah, Deb's just had a phenomenal day on the on this river, I mean, this pristine river, 12 hours we've come down, some rapids, some beautiful quiet sections, and then we come around at a lovely evening and you tell us that, that this is going to be dammed, that there's going to be a dam here, and you point back there. Yep, so just up along between that hilltop there, there's an, going to be an 85 metre high dam, or proposals for an 85 metre high dam for a hydroelectric scheme, so that would flood pretty much everywhere where we've been rafting today, right down that whole length of the River Craig. And it's, it's a real concern for us, obviously, because we've got some pretty special places in there. It's an amazing gorge, beautiful forests, and there's threatened species, birds. All those things are in that river, and all those things will be under threat by this dam proposal. But I mean, just how big it's going to be, it's outrageous. You're saying where, where that ridge starts to yep. get steeper, right across to that ridge over there. Yep, that's, that's the site that's been chosen. I mean, that's, because That's massive. That's about equal to a 20-storey building that we're going to be putting here, putting in the way of this river. Yeah. Meridian Energy investigated the suitability of many West Coast rivers for hydro generation. Most had insufficient flows or were already protected. The Mokianui, Meridian says, is the only realisable opportunity for meeting the growing West Coast demand for power but at what cost to one of our last great untouched rivers. It's taking out about 330 hectares of forest and river itself, and that would all be um, flooded under, under 80 metres of water, which of course is not anything that's a good habitat for any fish, or especially not our birds and, and native land snails that live here as well. The Mokahinui for us is the defining line in the sand, because this is a very special place from here on up to those headwaters is all public conservation land. It's all land that's been protected, it's all land that's got very high conservation values. And we face losing those places because of unrealistic demands for energy and, and um, outrageous schemes like this proposal. I mean, you just need to spend a day in the river deep within the, the kind of realms of those walls and, and witness some of the, the huge size of those granite boulders, the trees that just start towering up above the canopy and the rapids, everything that's within yeah, there is, yeah. is amazing. And it's when you spend you know, a long day like we have today and you start really appreciating what, what would be lost. Further downstream, Mike Joy tells me about another notable inhabitant of this river, the white bait. New Zealanders know about eels, you know, they don't know as much as we'd like to know, obviously, but uh, we know about eels, we know about white bait. But I, from it, listening to you, there's a lot under these rivers in the water that we just don't know about. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I don't even know that people really know about white bait. I mean, I know they right. know what's in their fritter, yeah. but, you know, and they know what they taste like, and they know they want to go and, you know, catch them but yeah. you know the, there's so much more to white bait you know there's five species that are in that fritter or potentially in that in that fritter and so um, and all five of them live up this river the adults and the one that I guess that most people think of as the white bait is the inanga which lives in the lower part of the river and goes down into the tidal area to spawn and then they live a year or so and do that spawn and die but the other five species live for much longer, uh, decades and decades. And, and, I mean, and hopefully survive. they don't all end up as fritters. No, no, I mean, hopefully is not. Is that a problem? Are, are we overfishing our native fish? Yeah, we are. Um, but uh, if it was just the fishing, it would be all right. But right. there's so many other impacts on our rivers. Well, you think about how New Zealand would have been before humans got here, and the Makanui is a, a really good example of that, you know. So they would have been clean and low productivity and not much sediment, and now they're full of sediment and right. there are lots of nutrients from farming and from human waste so we've turned we've just changed the world completely for them so everything we're doing is bad for them you know so that's why I guess that this this these rivers would just become so much more important because of that two-thirds of our native fish species are now on the threatened species list so you know we, we have that's happening already and and you know the modelling work that I've done show if it keeps declining the way it is by 2050 we basically won't have any native fish left or well, it'll be very few because they're just disappearing at that kind of rate. Like 2050 yeah. very few native yeah. fish left in our rivers. Yeah. That's an indictment on us yeah. as much as we love our water and yeah, love our rivers. Yeah yeah we obviously native fish seem to you know fish just miss you know somehow they miss out on any protection that we give to other animals you know this mm. is it's a shame, real shame. Mike's words cause me real anxiety. 
If the history of the Earth is a clock face, we humans have been here for just a fraction of a second. Do we really want ours to be the generation that destroys our natural world and wipes out our ancient flora and fauna purely because of our own stupidity and greed? It makes me value my brief moments in a wilderness like the Mokianui. But it also makes me wonder how much of this will be left for our grandkids. Coming up, I reach the Mokianui's mouth and civilization, and I find out just how the locals feel about what's happening to their river. If there is a dam break, um, we'll be inundated within eight minutes. I'm on the last day of my journey down the wonderful Mokianui River. There's no doubt this wild waterway has an impact on all who come into contact with it, and not the least the local Māori, who have been connected with the river, or Awa, for centuries. I'm meeting West Coast local Rick Barber. Over the last three days, we've had an amazing voyage, amazing journey on this river. But I already feel that it, it, it has a sort of a, almost a personality of its own, almost a spirit of its own. How do you see that in Māori terms? Well, um, of course we say the Awa, the Awa does absolutely have a spirit. In Māori terms, we call it um, often the Māori, the life-giving forces of the Awa. This Awa, like many of our Awa, are just sacred to us, really. They're so special. And we know when we look up the Awa that uh, the view we get up here is virtually identical to the ones of the first peoples that came here from Hawaii. Your people used the river, I understand, as a greenstone route, as a Panamu route? Well, the Awa were all routes for many purposes, um, whether it be to get Kai Awa or also to um, some places were used as Wānanga learning sites, up different Awa. Um, this was used as a, as, a, as a route for military purposes and it was used as a route for Ponamu. Just okay. a route is a route. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, so it had whatever the needs were, if the route met the needs, it was used. And you named the river Mokianui. What, what's the significance of that? Well, the, the name is um, uh, very significant. To cross the Awa here, there were no bridges in the um, in old times, of course, and, and uh, to cross it, you needed a raft, and a, a big raft, and um, the, the uh, traditional Māori raft is a mokahi. Uh, they needed a big one down there, and they made a mokahi nui. It was parked up for anyone to use to cross the river both sides and um, hence the name. You need the, when you get to the Moka Inui, the big raft, you're at that river. And, and the river must have been very important in terms of an eel supply and, and these days eels are in trouble. They, they are losing their habitat all over New Zealand. They need rivers like this one that are unmodified um, and that must be a blow to, to Māori people that, that one of their you know, traditional food sources is, is very much under threat these days. Our natural kai, our tuna and um, our kai moana um, is in trouble. I mean, we know fish stocks are in trouble all around the world, but even here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and uh, there are big questions we have to grapple with and we can't waste too much time on it. All the kai awa is taonga here, the natural kai awa, and uh, they're meant to be protected and um, fostered, you know, but what we've seen is their constant decline since um, really, since really, since human occupation, you could yeah. argue, but yeah, you especially could. since modern industrial times. Yep. So yep. Um, the decline is constant, and it's very sad for us to see that happening. One thing that's hanging over this river is this dam. I mean, that that huge dam that's going to go up just behind us here, that that's going to have a heavy effect, isn't it? It is. Uh, in my view, it is. In our view, it's reversible. Uh, they need to dig down about nine metres into the uh, bed of the Awa to Daniel. get the foundations and blast the banks and, um, and block this Awa to uh, generate a pressure head to uh, create um, electrical energy. Mm. And um, to do that irreversibly changes this Awa forever, um, really. Well, forever is a long time, but mm. and certainly for the next few thousand years. We value the Awa, um, and also um, we understand the fact that we live in a modern world, but. Uh, We've come to the conclusion through our consultation that most of our people don't support this um, construction here in this hour because there's alternatives to it, but also because there's no alternatives to the Mokohanui Te Taonga because when it's gone, you can't make another one. We would like it to be the same for our great, great, great Mokopuna in the future to come here and to these places and they deserve our protection as guardians today, as kaitiaki, mm -hmm. to, um, to be here. And if we don't do the right mahi and the right job to um, ensure that they're here for them, yep. then the tūpuna will know that we have failed. I'm with Rick. It's our duty to protect what's left of our environment for future generations. 
As I near the river's mouth, I find myself heading for town. This is the fabled West Coast, a remote, sparsely populated part of New Zealand. And I'm about to visit a couple of classic West Coast settlements, the small riverside towns of Seddonville and Mokianui. Seddonville was named back in 1893 in honour of New Zealand Premier Richard Seddon. King Dick, as he was known, was hoping the town would prosper from coal and gold mining. But it wasn't to be. The state coal mine closed in 1914, and these days Seddonville is a tiny settlement reliant on farming and tourism. I'm curious to find out exactly what the locals think about the dam proposed for their valley. Dam up the Makanui, what was your first reaction when you heard about it? I didn't believe it, uh, um. because I'd heard that um, they had, um, it had been looked at a proposal to dam the dam in the 1970s, and that it had been canned because of the serious seismic risk. I mean, Seddonville was actually taken out in, before our time in 1929. Do you have any anxiety about living below a dam that's just up, up the road from you? Most certainly, because the earthquake scenario yeah. is that if there is a dam break, um, we'll be inundated within eight minutes. The water would be above my house here. There would be no chance of escape if there was a dam break. Yeah, Dan, I have you been going through the uh, Lyle and down the Makanui the other day in, in a long tramp. How hey, was that? Yeah, that was beautiful. Beautiful place to be. It cool. was fantastic. Mm. We don't need that power. I'd say we need the resource of, of, of the natural land rather than the resource of that power. Even just white baiting it will affect, which most mm. of us enjoy around here. Yep. So it affects a lot of recreation, especially while they're building it. It's such a beautiful spot that you just want to see it stay the way it is. Right. Why touch it? There's something very majestic about the Makanui. It's very beautiful. It's got really high indigenous values mm. that other places just don't have. It's imperative that it's kept in the um, state that it's in at the moment, or what? even better. But just down the road at the Makianui pub, I find some different points of view. There's going to be a, a dam in this region. How do you think it's going to affect the place? Well, I've been involved in other, other power schemes through the country, and a lot of people are scared of the impact on the area and things, but nowadays it's done very well. It's, it fits the environment, and there's a lot of caution taken and make sure it's all dead right. You yep. can't do any harm. Yeah, but, but even, I mean, it's going to flood the big gorge, isn't it? But, oh, uh, a lot of floods. Flood's probably part of the valley that probably people, not many people venture in anyhow, like um, enhances the, yep. brings more people to the area to see the lake. How do you feel about the proposed dam? Um, yeah, no, we're quite, quite for it, it'd be good for the area, yeah. What sort of ways would it be good for the area, do you think? Oh, you get more business, more people coming in and, you know, lots of people staying and that, so. Yep. Good for accommodation and all that, good for a business like us, the pub, the pub. <laughs> come in and drink, yeah. True enough. And then, you know, recreation, be better for that too, you know, people will be able to canoe or whatever up there. What do you think the dam will bring to the region? Well, it'll bring, it'll bring um, enormous growth, I would think, to the region. It's proposed that there's going to be 350 odd workers there working for two to three years. As a publican, you've got to be a little bit impartial to uh, issues that we have here, like the Makanui Dam or the uh, 1080. Yep for example, so you remain impartial, you don't. But I am for the dam and I am against 1080, so there you go. <laughs> so there are arguments on both sides, for and against the dam. I for one believe that this wild river should be left just as it is, as nature intended. At the Mokianui's mouth, where it pours into the Tasman Sea, I meet local farmers John and Raywin McTaggart, who have lived beside the river for 25 years. You're living in a special part of the river because this is where the river, this extraordinary river that I've followed from right up in the mountains, comes down to the ocean and, and it, it gives itself up to the ocean in some ways, doesn't it? Yes. This great force that's come from the sky has given itself up to the ocean. This is a meeting place for nature because you've got the river, you've got the sea. Yep. You're really um, open, you're exposed to the, four, the wind from the four directions. So when we get our heaviest rain, which is a nor'wester from that direction yeah, there, yeah. Yep. crosses over the sea, so picks up moisture as it comes. Um, you watch the passage of the sun and the moon across the sky because this is the last place where it sets during the oh, day. Okay, the sunset, yeah. So there's just so many brilliant 
things that are associated with being here, so many things where it's, it's so natural, mm. just forces of nature coming into play, they're just in harmony with each other here. spiritual place for all of us. I'm forever thankful for what I um, for what the river provides. Yeah. And it does it provide does. the abundance of gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gifts you put on your table, yes. gifts that you put in your yes. mind, gifts that yes. are, are part of your spirituality. Yeah. You know, we must learn to say thank you. Mm. And what do you think about the, the notion that we might be able to in some way give something back to the river? Um, the river's given us so much. We give a voice, a voice because the river can't speak for itself. So if we see occasions where people are acting to the river's detriment, well then you give something back, what can you give, but you give your voice. So you stand up and make yourself heard, make yourself known that, hey, this isn't right, maybe we shouldn't be doing this, maybe we should be looking for alternatives. Yeah, yep, yep. And it's basically, yeah, all we can give is like, like just the voice, our mm. voice. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's in part, as a photographer, I feel that if I can take some images in the gorge or yeah. some images up on the top and just say that, you know, here is a thing of beauty, here is, yeah. here is a thing that, uh, that we didn't create, that is stunningly beautiful, that we can move through and enjoy, yeah. then I've given, yeah. albeit a little bit back. Yeah. Gives us a lot of joy, I guess. Yeah, I reckon. Makes us happy. It does. Good to be by a river. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And this river. This yeah, river this in particular, river. the yes. Makanui. Over the past few days, I've been lucky enough to travel the length of one of our last great untouched rivers. A river now under the threat of a dam. As we were making this program, a number of environmental and recreational groups were planning appeals against the dam, so it's by no means a done deal. I know we all need power, but destroying one of our last great wildernesses cannot be the answer. If there's any justice, the Mokianui will be left alone to flow on unimpeded, wild and free.